Yeah, first of all, I'd just like to um, thank Miguel for inviting me um, here today. I normally only talk about uh, medieval documents uh, with fellow medievalists, so it's quite exciting to be able to talk about documents in a completely different context and with uh, people who are not just historians. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, okay, so what I'll do is um, I'll just um, start by giving a very uh, brief sort of overview uh, about medieval archives, um, how, you know, how we define them, what they are, and also the types of documents that you're likely to find in them. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll focus specifically on um, the paper archives in the Vatican. That's really what, what I do, that's my own research. And there's you know, so much to, to talk about, but I'll just refine it um, to a few particular examples. And what I tend to look at is, um, is cross-cultural contact. So um, the relations between, for example, Christians and Muslims in the Mediterranean, um, especially trading. Um, and the paper archives are interesting to this because the Catholic Church and in the Middle Ages, um, tried to prevent um, contact as much as possible between um, Catholics and other religious groups. But at the same time, um, the archives actually shed a lot of light on this, which is slightly contradictory. So anyway, I'll give you a few examples of those. Okay, so um, first of all, yeah, what, what is a, a medieval archive and what sort of document are we talking about? So, I mean, there are various types of archives, as I'm, I'm sure uh, many of you are aware of anyway. Um, so you have sort of national archives, um, uh, the, the, the English National Archives, the Q being one example. So um, documents pertaining to, for example, um, a royal court, so the kings or monarchs of, of England, for example, their diplomatic correspondence is kept in, in national archives. Also, um, city archives. So for the medieval period, um, the Italian cities were especially important. They're probably have the, uh, they probably have the most important um, secular city archives of the period, especially uh, Venice, Genoa, Florence, Milan, the big trading um, republics of, of the Middle Ages. And that's just a photo of the Venetian archives, and that's the sort of archives that, that I look at, as well as the, um, the papal um, ones as well. And then private archives as well. So, for example, archives of a particular um, prominent family um, or archives of a family who have um, gained enough wealth to, to buy uh, documents from elsewhere. So there's a Bibliotheca Icardiana in, um, in Florence, which just has lots of different manuscripts from, uh, from, well, from Italy and, and elsewhere, which have been um, accumulated over the years. Um, and the types of documents we're talking about, um, First of all, things like, like charters, legal documents, so wills, testaments, grants of land, things like that. Um, monastic archives, uh, don't have, don't have to mention them in too much detail, again, will we'll hold a lot of um, charters and sort of uh, um, courses relating to uh, the grants of land and things like that. Um, also, um, things like pipe rolls. So in the, uh, in the National Archives in Kew, you have all the, all the rolls of, uh, of the English monarchs and so really diplomatic correspondence, so I suppose the equivalent of minutes for parliamentary meetings, uh, copies of letters sent to other monarchs in you know, France, to the Pope, things like that. And with the, um, the actual rolls, what they are is they're different sort of smaller documents that are sewn together, so that's why you can see the sort of zigzag line there. Um, they're rolled up, shoved in a pipe and, and archived away. So that's really how, how they would work. Um, and then also, I should mention, um, non-Latin archival documents as well. I'm a sort of Western European specialist, so I'm uh, not you know, particularly familiar with, um, with say, um, Islamic archives or Jewish archives, but they do pertain to my, my research as well. So the Cairo Geniza being one example, so Hebrew and Arabic um, documents kept in Cairo, which pertain to all sorts of things, um, but some of them um, have information on them, which is say, the Quran and Christian thing as well. Okay, so that's, you know, Brief overview. Um, uh, and the one archive I didn't mention there was the paper archive. So the Archivio Secreto Vaticano, or the Vatican Secret Archives, as they're known. Secret's a bit of a misleading um, name, but really what it was is they were, the, yeah, <laughs> I can look at them. So far, yeah. But they were, um, they were founded in 1611, um, but they were restricted. So originally, not many people would have access to them unless they were uh, working in the papal chancery. But in 1881, they were opened up to the public, so I suppose that's sort of why the name um, exists. Um, and they're actually in, in the Vatican City, in the Cortillo uh, del Belvedere, in that doorway there. And it's quite fun to use them, because you go in through the sort of uh, very grand entrance to the Vatican, and the Swiss guards salute you, and you walk through, and 
it's quite, it's quite a sort of strange experience, but it's a very, um, yeah, very nice place to work. Uh, extremely modern as well, and very sort of well organised. Um, and really, uh, the sort of information, the sort of documents that the, um, the Vatican archives contain are hugely varied, millions of documents. Um, first of all, you have just you know, sort of illuminated manuscripts, so nice sort of commissioned um, books. But really, the archive doesn't specialise in them. They're more in um, the realm of, of, the, of the Vatican Library. And what the archive really has in abundance is some diplomatic correspondence. That's why it exists. That's what um, you, researchers um, use it for. Um, what's important about the Vatican, I suppose, and what sets it apart from other medieval archives is that it's not restricted to any geographical sort of parameter. It's, you know, say the, the, the English National Archives or the French or so forth, you're going to have information of those nations, but not, not so much elsewhere. But the Vatican and the medieval church, because it was it encompassed all of Latin Christendom, it's a bit like, say, the NATO or EU or something like that. You have an archive which you know, pertains to lots of different areas and has correspondence between different rulers, different clerics, and so forth. So it's very useful in that regard. So yeah, it's really full of, um, of these different diplomatic uh, documents. I suppose the most well-known being papal bulls. So these are essentially letters written from, from the Pope, um, signed by him, and dispatched to rulers of Europe, um, also to archbishops, people like that, you know, commanding them to, to do whatever. Um, and they're full bulls because of the lead seal at the bottom there, which is known as a bulla. So that's the name of them. But really what it is is a, a papal letter written by the Pope or by their scribes and, and, and sent out for diplomatic correspondence. Um, but then, in addition to the bulls, you also have a series of other different um, archival materials kept there. So, uh, financial records, um, uh, petitions, things like that. So, anything that really pertains to, to administration, I suppose, much like a, a modern um, administrative archive as well. Um, and the one that, are, that I really looked at in a lot of detail, and I'll give you some examples of, is, um, is the petition. So the petition was made at the papal chancery for certain um, favours. And just to give you some sort of outline of the kind of the numbers I'm dealing with and the kind of actual sources. So, so these petitions, basically, they're made by people, it could be anyone. You could be a merchant from Genoa, you could be a, a monk from you know, Northumbria, you could be a, you know, a lord from, from uh, Iberia, or wherever. Um, and you'd go to the papal chancery and you would make a petition to the Pope in order to gain some sort of favour, grant of land, um, or, in my case, a trading exemption, which allows you to trade in the Muslim world. And that's what I look at. So the Pope's um, granted these exemptions to different merchants, which said, OK, normally it'd be illegal for you to trade in Cairo or in Alexandria, um, because you know, we don't like Latin um, communicating and, and interacting with Muslims, but we will give you an exemption to do this. And these exemptions survive in this register of petitions in the papal chancery. Um, and the ones I looked at in detail are from one pope at Clement VI in a, a 10 year period. Um, and the actual register of petitions, the Register Supplicationa, um, exists from the beginning of, of Clement's uh, reign right up until 1799. Um, in total, there's 7,365 volumes of these petitions, <laughs> and they're not published, so um, obviously I'm not going to have a look at very many in, in the overall context. Um, the petitions for this particular pope um, are volumes 1 to 24, and these are my very rough calculations. We're talking about 4,250 folios, so different pages of, of manuscripts. Um, on those folios, but, um, so that's one example, that's page 1 of the first volume. Um, you have about 15 to 20,000 entries, so we're still on the average about five entries per, per folio, um, which pertain to many things. So um, you're talking about a lot of a lot of archive material here, a lot of petitions to have to sift through to try and find the sort of thing that, that, that I'm interested in. Um, and I suppose now what I'll talk about is you know, the sort of things that I'm looking for and how I find them. Um, unfortunately, in medieval history, I think it's all quite old fashioned, and there's no real way of of, um, of navigating through these except for page by page to just scrolling through them. Um, the problem being is that they're in Latin and they're handwritten, so the paleographical skills that you need to read it 
mean that as far as I know, there's no future program that can accurately transcribe this stuff in the next, the next step we'll be able to search them. So it is just a matter of going through these documents. Uh, but what you can do is you get used to picking up certain place names. So mine almost always say Alexandria, Cairo, Syria, Constantinople, the Sultan of Babylon, for example, is the, the, the Sultan of Cairo. Words like that which stand out because they're obviously quite different from all the other Latin words that we see. So your eye gets very trained to just to responding through these things, to seeing um, words that, that, that stand out from the page. Um, and also the, the, the Vatican archives are incredibly well um, organized and the clerics and the scribes who use them had a very sort of advanced system um, of, 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 sort of ordering these things. Um, at the beginning of each folio, there's usually sort of a summary, an index page almost. And they're all dated, so you can navigate them through date, although it's not the same calendar as we use, so you have to get used to that. Um, and also, there's marginal, <coughs> marginal annotations. So often for the sort of trading exemptions that I look at, they'll have something written in the, in the, um, in the margin, uh, de navis or de galea, which normally means about a ship or a, or a galley, and that's, that means it's a trade license. So the certain methods, the more of these things you look at, the more you sort of understand how they've been and how you can navigate through them. And okay, so um, how do I interpret these and transmit them into my research? Um, so first of all, um, you can look at the different locations of the recipients of these exemptions. So I found just under 100 of them for this 10-year period. There's probably more, um, but um, you know, that's, that's what I found when I was working on the Vatican. Um, most of them pertain to people from Genoa and Venice. Um, and other Italian cities, they're the main trading republic, so that sort of makes sense. But also uh, kings of, um, uh, of Mallorca, of Aragon, uh, Cyprus, and people like that, and lots of French nobles as well. Um, so you can look at the locations. Also, I'm interested in the, the sort of goods that they're talking about. So a lot of the time, they're quite ambiguous. They say, uh, we'll give you permission to send five ships to Middle and Round. You know, it could be whatever that they like. Um, but some of them give, um, name particular luxury goods. So just one example here, um, this merchant, um, Johannes de Catanaeus, um, who's um, a Genoese merchant, probably from the Pisic island of Chios, he's given permission to ship this stuff called mastic. I don't know if anyone would have ever tried mastic. Um, it comes from, from Chios, one of the Greek Aegean islands. It's basically a, a medicinal, almost like a chewing gum, you use it in cooking, um, also other sort of types of, of, um, of flavoring, a bit like eucalyptus. And this, believe it or not, was incredibly um, um, lucrative, but incredibly um, sort of expensive um, good, which was very popular in the Middle East. So this is the kind of stuff that was shipped by these merchants to um, Muslim lands in the Middle East. Also, you have um, certain other goods or animals in it. Okay? So this um, example uh, allows a guy called Stephen Rosarius of Montpellier to ship 25, um, so it's Griffalcos Seu Falcone, which means um, geofalcons and falcons. And these ones are particularly important because they're, um, they're geofalcons and they come from Arctic land, so northern um, Scandinavia, Iceland, places like that. And they're shipped to the Mamluk Sultan in Cairo. So the actual process of doing that, it's quite much short. Um, the process of shipping these um, birds from you know, really Arctic regions right down to the heart of Egypt is obviously quite complicated. And these sources highlight this kind of transaction, which really, in a medieval world, not many sources are going to comment on this. And you might have some evidence of a guy perhaps buying these in France from one of the, the um, people who caught them in, uh, in the Arctic regions for the transaction in Cairo, but having the thing that links them together is quite important. So that's one example. Also, just to um, uh, give a couple more, and then I'll, then I'll finish off. So um, we have another example of a group of merchants here. Um, uh, I won't give their names. Three merchants from, um, from uh, Constantinople, Genoa, and also um, Pera, which is the same as Comnos, but uh, Constantinople. And they're given permission um, to ship um, 20 um, uh, modi, sorry, 20,000 modi, which is basically a, a weight measure, um, of grain um, from um, Turkey or, or other um, Islamic lands. Um, to Constantinople, and that's what the Latin says there at the bottom. And this is quite interesting because Constantinople at the time was Greek. 
Orthodox Christian, and these are Latin and Greek merchants. So the fact that they're allowed to import um, grain from, from the plant lands is, is, is quite unusual. Um, and it says in the license that um, they had actually visited Avignon in person to make this petition. They'd come from part of Greece. The Neapolis said Apostolic See, um, which is where the, the bakery was, moved by noble zeal and pure devotion. So these guys had actually gone there to petition for this, this license and it had been awarded. And what's also interesting about, interesting about this is that one of the, the merchants in that last license, which pops up again, this guy called Johannes Chrysoloras. And in this second license, he's given permission to send some chips to Alexandria, and he's called um, the, the Logotatus to Strasbourg, which means the military logotate or military sort of commander. And it's Greek for the Byzantine army in Constantinople. So this is a guy who's working for the, the Greek Byzantine emperor, so not Catholic, um, Orthodox. Um, but he's petitioning in a papal curia, so presumably he's converted to, to Catholicism. And he's sending ships to Alexandria, also to Turkey, both Islamic. And then later on, you know, he's dying in Venice about 20 years later. So this is a really good example of these merchants crossing these different cultural and religious boundaries uh, in the medieval period. Um, and so slightly bizarrely, the evidence of this is in the papal archives and the papacy, <laughs> the people that are trying to prevent this kind of contact. From them. Now, just to um, give you my very final example before I, I wrap it up, um, with these different trading exemptions, you can also compare them to other archives. Um, and I haven't done this in as much detail as I'd like to do that in the future. So we have one here of a man called Matty Geiser, a merchant from clermont ferrand um, in France. And he's given permission to send a galley to, uh, to Egypt. And it just ha so happens that a Genoese notary, so someone working in sort of recording accounts um, in the Middle East, also reports of this guy here and the same merchant. Um, in Beirut um, and in Damascus as well. Um, and what his, his archives, or his sort of notary records, um, record are a commercial voyage from Damascus to Aigues Mortes in southern France and then from there on to Genoa. And he names the same agent who had got this um, papal license um, in 1343. So this um, sort of uh, combination of a, of a papal source and a genuine source uh, links trade between the Latin, Latin and the Islamic worlds. And I've just sort of mapped uh, the journey of the boats which he was using called the St. Jacob or St. Jacobus. And um, from the different sources, we know, first of all, he gets the, the permission to trade from the Pope in 1343 in Avignon. He's then in Damascus um, about six months later, a bit longer, um, where he's loading some, or buying some goods. Then in September, he's in Beirut, loading his goods onto a boat. He's then in Messina in December, um, eight more probably in the spring, and then finally onto Genoa in the late spring of 1345. So you have, you know, by combining these sources, really interesting pathways of actually how these people operated. And this, this stuff is, is hard to get hold of because individual archives on their own probably will only give you one side of, of the picture. So it's basically combining different cultural archives to gain a sort of um, wider perspective. Um, so what is the future of archival documents in medieval history? Well, um, hopefully sort of digitization projects, I mean, they do exist, but the problem is actually literally having to transcribe all this, this data means that everything is, is essentially held up by that. So, um, you know, hopefully in the future, the work that I've done, for example, could be made turn into a database, which would access all the other, the other scholars as well. And there's also um, sort of big projects to um, to make, say, prosopographical databases, so all the names and details of all these different merchants <coughs> um, being made searchable so other people can access them and compare them. Um, also, um, using tools like social network analysis, potentially, to make these links and other types of, of, um, of document analysis. But this is all stuff which um, I have yet to really implement in my own research, but I hope to um, in the future. So hopefully um, some of you are working on those kinds of things. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, listening. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so we've got time for yeah, a couple of questions uh, or comments. Yes, please. I find that really fascinating. I, I don't know anything about this area, but it's 
It's just substantive difference between research because it's too good. Does that shape so that'd be a question, but does that then shape your analytical focus? Because you were less interested in the construction of the text themselves than how you really point to pathways or mm -hmm. circulations and relationship. But would the other medieval historians not with the focus on trading mm -hmm. be much more embedded in the text itself? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think what's interesting about these is that because they pertain to trade, but they're kept in the papal archives, no one really looks at them because a traditional sort of economic historian of the Middle Ages would look, say, exclusively at Rome or Venice or, you know, the big trading republics and the notarial records, the sort of financial transactions and so forth. But these sort of slip between the, slip through the net because they are, I suppose, they're an archive which is of church history, not, yeah, not trade. So... So yeah, I think they, in that sense, uh, yeah, an economic historian might interpret them in a slightly different way. I wouldn't consider myself an economic historian necessarily. And yeah, perhaps I'm working exclusively on the medieval papacy. I think, in a way, what they've tended to do when they have used the same registers is that they've looked at all the, the sort of clerical um, privileges and things granted. So it's not that they've looked at the same documents and interpreted them differently. It's just that they haven't looked at those documents at all because they're not interested in trade essentially and I think with and one of the problems with them is they're they're incredibly formulaic and each entry is quite short it's a small paragraph and most of it is just the sort of papal formulaic jargon which they use so so actually the, the information that you can glean from them is, is quite limited sometimes it is almost you get the name of the merchant you have a date you have a destination that he's going to um, and something about perhaps how many ships or the commodity. Um, so really, the you know the, the documents themselves are, are slightly dry. So I try to sort of get as much as I can by looking at all these sort of different examples. But I think to really get a rich idea, you have to in a way compare them to these other compare them to the genesis and the, and the finishing material as well. And hopefully, I mean, I'd love to do the, the Arabic material. That would be be great, but that doesn't unfortunately provide the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, it's, it's something like, yeah, yeah, and I think really what needs to be done is um, you, need, you need basically a database of everyone working in medieval archives, especially anything, say, pertaining to the Mediterranean. You need to just start inputting this data of these merchants, and then you can compare it all to, yeah, and have it so, so we can see how many ships travelled from here to here, because, you know, for me alone, I've, yeah, I looked at a hundred of these, and I, you know, I do try and sort of do some analysis with you know numerical analysis but it's it's such a small data set and i'm missing yeah. so much because i'm not i haven't done the same in venice and genoa or barcelona well, or messina oh. oh yeah no exactly and that's exactly oh. what i want to do yeah. yeah and i think it's a problem with medieval history that each person looks at their particular field because it just takes so long to go through these things um, so you have yeah lots of sort of very specific small studies but no bigger picture and the only way of really doing that is just to combine this all into some sort of database. So I think perhaps now that people are starting to see that that could be the future. So it's something that I would like to do as yeah. my stuff certainly. And, and you corroborate on what you're saying in African archives as well. Mm. European archives and I feel that you look at it. Yeah. Exactly, yeah and you give it so it's very close by Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's the sort of stuff that yeah if you just look in one archive you know, yeah, you won't you won't get that sort of picture, but it's yeah. it's, a, it's so time consuming really to do that. I mean, to, yeah, do that sort of research in all these different archives and, and know what to look for really, um, and know what periods to, to, to 